Chapter 22. Max's Story Max told his story, and for some reason or another, each of the dueling hearts was curious enough not to interrupt him. He looked away from the dueling hearts, putting his hood back up, but now only the normal shadow of his hood clung to his face rather than some soul-conjured darkness, so his expression could still be seen. This story has a pretty common start among soul-takers, Max explained in an off-handed way, which spoke of just how painfully normal his traumas had become. When I was young, my parents died. I didn't have any other family, so, through a series of unfortunate events, I ended up in the foster system. My foster parents only wanted me for the money. They ignored me, sequestered me away in my bedroom, put me down. He averted his gaze toward the ground, and even hit me sometimes. They got away with it for a long time before CPS found out, and when they did, I was taken away from them, and they were heavily fined. I was processed and given to another family, but by then the damage had already been done. I was afraid of people, jumpy and quiet. I hid my face. I didn't know how to talk to anyone. I said strange things at strange times because I had never been taught not to. My foster parents at the time had expected a quote-unquote normal child. I had looked normal in the paperwork, after all. So when they realized that I was strange rather than work with me, rather than teach me, they gave me up. No other families were available, Max continued, so I ended up in an orphanage. There wasn't a single person there who would give me the time of day. The adults didn't really have the time, but when it came to the other kids, they just didn't want to. If two perfectly nice and normal adults thought I was too strange to be around, you can only imagine how a bunch of kids and teenagers felt about me. I'd get into fights, especially each morning after I left the home to walk to school. Back then, it never even crossed my mind to fight back, so I was always hurt, always in pain. Then Randy came to live at the orphanage, Max explained, his voice turning wistful, his lips curling into a subtle smile that never quite reached his eyes. Randy was different. He'd lost his parents in an accident, just like me, just like many of us, but he never seemed to let it get to him. He was smart and charismatic. If anyone gave him trouble, he could usually talk his way out of it, but when that failed, he had another option. As much as Randy was charming, he was also strong. Before losing his parents, he'd learned to fight from his dad. He knew martial arts and even how to use his soul. He was the strongest person around, and he was a good enough person not to use that strength to hurt people without a good reason. He even decided, for some reason, to use that strength to protect the most pathetic, weakest person he could find. One day, when we were walking to the bus, Max described, I accidentally tripped one of the guys who liked to hit me. He got mad and started swinging. Randy saw. He hadn't really talked to me before. He was a couple years older than me, and a lot more normal. He hadn't ever had a reason to talk to me before. But when he saw me getting beat up, he threw down his school bag and he stepped in to stop it. It didn't take him long. My bullies didn't want to mess with him. He talked them down, sent them away, along with the other kids who were there with us, and hung back with me to make sure I was alright. When he noticed that his things had fallen out of his bag, he didn't blame me. In fact, as he gathered up his things, he offered to spend time with me. He showed me what he dropped, a box of collectible game cards, and he asked me if I wanted to stay after school and play with him and some of his classmates. I didn't know what to say. I thought he wanted something from me, or to trick me, so I ended up telling him no. From that point forward, though, Max continued... He kept an eye on me. He would talk to me and invite me to participate in stuff with him. Sports, mostly, which I wasn't any good at. I eventually said yes, just to get him to stop, and we became friends. I couldn't help it. I got swept up in him. He taught me to play his favorite trading card game, and soon our games became sort of my happy place. When being around my peers became too difficult, we'd go off together and play a few games, and things would be better. More importantly, though, Randy taught me to look out for myself in case there was ever a time when he couldn't be there. He was the one who taught me to use soul and the basics of martial arts, and encouraged me to develop my own style. I got strong, Max said, beaming with pride, so strong that soon none of the other kids could hurt me anymore. I could have gotten them back for what they'd done, but I knew that Randy wouldn't approve. He always thought better of me than I did. Either way, it wasn't long before people knew who we were, and there wasn't anybody around who wanted to mess with either of us anymore. We looked forward to the day when Randy turned 18. Companies were already showing interest in one day sponsoring him as a professional fighter. Once he was old enough, he intended to pursue their interest, become independent, and then become my legal guardian. He wanted to get me out of the system. It was still several years off, but it was something that both of us wanted, that both of us worked toward. Then, Max said, his tone changing, when Randy was 13 and I was 11, a man came to our orphanage. He wanted to foster us. He claimed that he was a great soul fighter, but that he fought under an alias. We didn't believe him but he showed us that he was strong. He said that if we came to stay with him, that he would teach us things that even Randy didn't know about Soul, and he promised that, once Randy was old enough to become emancipated, he would support us and help us achieve our dreams. 
It sounded too good to be true, and that's because it was. The man turned out to be an agent of the Soul Takers, Max remarked, all traces of his weak half-smile disappearing from his lips. He introduced us to the idea of joining. He made it seem like it was a good thing. He didn't use the name Soul Takers, of course. Doing so would have invited questions that he didn't want to answer yet. Instead, he just called it the organization. There are a lot of members who only know it as that, in fact. Members that our leader wants to make use of, but might become a problem if they knew what the Soul Takers are all about. Randy was one of those people. He believed in doing the right thing, and even though our sponsor tried to bring him all the way into the fold to make the Soul Takers feel like his family, he never got roped in. He had me, and I had him. Together, we were able to withstand the indoctrination that was directed toward us. Then we learned, Max continued, that the leader of the Soul Takers was coming to town. We lived with a bunch of other new members at the time in a group home in New Jersey. Our leader was coming to that very same group home to meet with one of our overseers. Randy saw this as an opportunity. He thought that he and I together could confront our leader, make him admit that the organization had some nefarious purpose, and even stop him if that turned out to be true. I argued with him. I was afraid, but Randy convinced me to try. You can do some good with your strength, he told me. So you should do it. It's the right thing. We didn't know at the time, though, that that was exactly why our leader had come. He'd learned how much trouble Randy and I were having acclimating and accepting our roles. He confronted Randy before Randy and I had a chance to put our plan into action, fighting him in a brutal heart-to-heart -heart in front of me and everyone. Randy was even stronger then than I am now, Max explained, his voice quivering, and our leader defeated him completely without effort, tortured him and killed him in front of us. Then he looked right at me and he told me, point blank, that he would do the same to me if I didn't serve him. That's the day my life ended, Max said. I thought I didn't have anything to lose, but our leader managed to take everything away from me anyway. I felt dead. I still do, to an extent. All that I had left was my actual, literal life, and whenever I thought about losing that too, the fear was too much. I went out of my way to do things that our leader asked, no matter how horrible. I became his most loyal follower, his right hand, and yet I knew he never trusted me. He could tell that, submissive or not, I wanted to kill him for what he'd done. So I had to keep proving myself to him, even after I proved that I was among the strongest in the organization and became a rogue hunter, ensuring that I wouldn't be forced to attack innocents anymore. I still wanted to kill him, he still knew it, and it didn't matter, because he was still that much stronger than me. Compared to me, to any of us, he met Joe's eyes. He might as well be an actual god. I lost hope, Max concluded, hanging his head. That's how he kept me under control all these years. It wasn't so much that I was afraid. I mean, I was afraid, and I still am. But more than that, taking Randy from me took my hope away. I no longer believed that things could get better for me. I no longer believed that our leader could be defeated. I no longer believed that I would ever not be afraid again. Fighting you, though, he said, meeting Joe's eyes, I felt some of that hope come back. I don't know if you can beat him, and if you insist on fighting the Soul Takers, you will have to fight him someday. But I think you might have the best chance of anyone I've met. That's our entire plan in a nutshell, Karen told him, speaking to him for the first time since her encounter with him at the old park, her tone resonating with sympathy rather than aggression. We saw the same potential in Joe and her dueling hearts, so we decided to help them in any way we can. It's not just Joe. Your leader was right. They all have fragments of the ancient soul. If anyone can beat him, you're right. It's them. She thought that she was agreeing with Max, that she understood his sentiment perfectly, so it was a surprise when he started shaking his head. No, he said. You don't get it. We're all strong, all twelve of us, but it's Joe in particular that I'm talking about. He looked her right in the eyes again. Maybe he's afraid of the ancient soul. I think he has to be. But the fact is that none of the rest of us will be able to grow our souls enough to stand up to him in time. You, though, Joe Zeeger, you're something special. You've grown so much stronger already since we first met, outside of a heart-to-heart, -heart, that it's remarkable. That's not even something that a fragment of the ancient soul can do for a person. You're special. I don't know how, but you are, and I think you can do it. I think you can beat him. Joe was taken aback. She didn't have even the faintest idea how to respond. How could this person, who had only just met her, think so highly of her? She'd done well against him, better than she had during their earlier encounter. But that didn't mean she had some ability that the others lacked. In fact, Joe was so put off by the very thought that she racked her brain for any excuse to change the subject even though she had the perfect, obvious excuse that Max still hadn't told her where to find her mom. She drew a blank, and Karen had to rescue her. Wait, Karen asked, confused. What did you mean when you said, we're all strong, all twelve of us? You sounded almost like you were counting all of us, she gestured to herself and all the other dueling hearts, as bearers of the fragments. This time it was Max's turn to look confused. 
He looked at Karen as if her question didn't make sense. Then it clicked for him, and he laughed his unsettling laugh, asking, <laughs> Wait, you didn't know? Didn't the three of you ever decide to try sensing the ancient soul in each other? From the looks on Karen, Monty, and Lawrence's faces, it was clear that the answer was no. So Max continued, You three, he explained, and me as well. We're all bearers of the fragments too. That's why our leader has been so willing to keep us around despite our history of insubordination and my past. He wanted us on hand to use his weapons against other bearers, and in case he needed to take our soul from us to keep himself alive in a really dire situation, when the rewards of absorbing only some of the fragments began to outweigh the risks. It's why he killed Randy to secure my loyalty rather than the other way around, and it's why, when I volunteered to come after you three and try to bring you back again, he actually said I could try. But it's also why he gave me a time limit. He didn't say it, but I knew he was worried that I'd decide to help you instead, that I'd make the same choice that you did. Max struggled against what injuries he still sustained, teetering back onto his feet, and he said, That's why I had to make the play that I made, attacking someone so much stronger than I am. I literally didn't have time to change my plan once I realized how powerful Shannon was. So, Sarah said, counting silently, if all of us have the fragments, and there are twelve like you said, then we only have one more person to find. No, we don't, Jen replied solemnly, almost like she hoped that no one would hear her. Chris is a bearer, too. Your sister? Tucker confirmed. Jen nodded. I'm somewhere around 90% sure. And you didn't say anything? Lawrence demanded. Jen glared at him and replied. She isn't much older than M, and she isn't even really a competitive fighter. Between all of that and the fact that our search was so far from over, I just wanted to give her as much time as I could before her life turned into a survival game too. No one argued with her. Even Lawrence could understand that. Still, the situation had grown tense, and no one quite knew what to say to relieve that tension, so silence fell upon them. It was Joe who broke it, sounding far more enthusiastic than anyone expected her to, given the recent tone of things. None of that matters, Joe said, drawing all eyes to her. This is perfect. You were even more right than you realized deciding to come to us for help, she said, looking to Karen. She turned to Max and said, It also means that you're supposed to be here too. You're supposed to help us, whether by fighting beside us or just giving us information. That's not really how the ancient soul fragments work, Monty replied thoughtfully. How do you know? Joe asked him. You told us that the properties of the fragments draw them to each other by bonding to people who meet during their lifetimes. That makes sense because they're all part of the same soul. They would be attracted to each other physically. But soul is also metaphysical and it knows things about people that even they don't know. It takes a different form for everyone because it can read and conform to what's in their hearts. Who's to say that if it can tell when two more people will meet, that it can't also tell whether those people will be important to each other? Who's to say that it didn't latch itself onto exactly the people who need to come together to ensure that they all survive? I don't know, Monty replied. I don't know how likely something like that is, or even if it's possible. Neither do I, Jen said. But honestly, Joe, I don't know if it really makes sense. You're talking about destiny. No, Joe said. I'm not. Not exactly. She hesitated, not sure how to explain it. Finally, she said, I just think that maybe Max being here means that we have a better chance with him on our side, that the nature of the ancient soul is something that exists out of time, allowed it to latch on to people who have the best chance of protecting it overall. Not that we're destined to win together, just that we have a chance where others might not. The others just looked at her, their expressions telling her that they weren't convinced. Tucker actually looked confused. He'd never really been interested in how soul worked anyway, above and beyond how he could use it. Looking at them all, even Joe was starting to wonder if her idea held any weight. I think it makes sense, said Kimmy with a big smile, but she didn't really sound convinced. The next person to speak, though, did. I think it sounds pretty reasonable, too, came a voice from out of the group's line of sight. They all turned and were surprised to see Shannon walking toward them. I've seen Soul do incredible things, she explained, that completely fly in the face of what we think we know about how it works. There's no reason to assume that Soul can't do what you're describing just because there's no evidence for it. Though Soul is pretty much the only thing in the universe that works that way. Mom? Sarah asked, running over to Shannon's side. Shannon smiled at her, and she fought back tears. She'd been far more worried about Shannon than she'd been letting on. Joe smiled too, beaming at her mother. She could feel that Max had been telling the truth, that Shannon was currently without access to her soul. But she still, somehow, wasn't surprised that Shannon hadn't needed the help of the Dueling Hearts to escape. It also, somehow, didn't surprise her that Shannon was so comfortable with this situation. Did you know, Joe asked Shannon, about all of this stuff with our souls and the soul takers, she clarified. Did you know? Shannon frowned like she didn't want to answer, but she still replied. The short answer is yes. I have heard rumors of the ancient soul, and I have encountered the soul takers before. 
When the Soul Takers came to challenge you, Mr. Wilson got in touch with me and let me know. Ever since, I've been keeping an eye on all of you. When you four, she explained, referring to the original Dueling Hearts, fought your second heart-to-heart -heart with Karen and her friends. I was nearby, ready to interfere if you needed me to. And when our new friend here, she looked at Max, she met Joe's eyes and put a hand on Sarah's shoulder, saying, I know you want to know why I didn't just tell you about this, and we can talk about that later. Right now, though, what's important is that I agree with Joe. I think that you being here, she looked again at Max, means something. I want to be clear that I still don't particularly like you, but if you really want to see your leader brought down, then you should help my daughter and her friends. She looked down as if she was reliving a painful memory. Believe me, they're our best hope. Max seemed almost repulsed by those words, like he couldn't bring himself to believe them. He shook his head. I don't know. I don't know if I can help you all, at least not directly. And honestly, it isn't as if I can lead you to our leader. And I never got close to anyone else after what happened to Randy. So if anyone does, I don't know who they are. You mentioned group homes for members, Joe reminded him. Can you tell us where any of those are? Someone there might have the information we need. That won't work, said Karen. If their leader even suspected that Max might desert the Soul Takers after this mission, he'll have already ordered his followers to abandon any meeting places that Max knows about. Besides, Monty added, whether he trusted Max fully or not, our leader kept him closer than anyone else. If Max doesn't know how to find him, then nobody else will either. Well, that puts the boot on our plan to go after him, Tucker complained. What can we do then? Wait and hope that he shows up in person one day? He wasn't kidding, and yet Max laughed his wicked laugh again. Don't say that as if it's unlikely. One way or another, I can't go back to the Soul Takers now. When I don't return, he hesitated before saying, There, leader, we'll put another plan into motion. One that he thinks can't possibly fail to come for all of us at once and take what he wants. If we manage to survive that, then there's a very good chance he'll come for us himself next. All the more reason for you to stand with us, Joe insisted. So we can protect each other, Max met her eyes. For just a moment, she saw yet another small glimmer of hope where there was usually none. She realized that she must have been the very first person since his late friend to show any amount of real concern for Max. And when that glimmer faded, she realized how much he had longed to experience that again, and how afraid he was to give in in case it was stolen from him for a second time. Max frowned, and Joe could see the gears turning in his head. She wanted to say something, to assure him that things wouldn't turn out like last time. But Max didn't trust her enough yet to believe that, and she wasn't even sure if she believed it herself. So she said nothing letting her suggestion hang in the air. Finally, he replied, I'll consider it, but for now, I've given you all that I can. I answered every question you asked. I need time to think, so unless you have some objection, I think I need some time alone. Joe did want to object. She could tell that some of the others wanted to as well. Lawrence was pacing again, as if he were anxious to pounce on Max and force him to stay where they could keep an eye on him. Even Rocky looked from Max to Joe as if he didn't think that letting the Soul Taker go would be a good idea, but that he didn't know if it was his place to say so. On the other side of things, though, Kimmy seemed perfectly okay with the idea of Max leaving, and Monty and Karen, who both seemed to have been affected by Max's story, looked sympathetic but indifferent, as did Jen and Sarah. In most cases, Joe would have asked for a vote, but she believed Max's story. She believed in him. But unlike the Soul Takers, she didn't want him to stay with them just because she thought of him as a resource. Just like with Karen, Monty, and Lawrence, Joe wanted to save Max from his past and build a life for him where he wouldn't have to face that kind of abuse again. But she wasn't sure that her teammates felt the same way, and she didn't want their sentiments driving Max away for good. That in mind, she made an executive decision. She nodded at Max, and without missing a beat, he was gone, leaving behind a single puff of black smoke.